Okay, um, let's get started here. Uh, what I want to accomplish with this lecture is I want to help you to get oriented as to what we're going to be seeing. And uh, the way the history, uh, you know, chronologically, how that works out with respect to our tour. Now, our tour is not exactly in chronological order, so that may be a little confusing. But the more you get, you know, kind of... A, a, Assimilated, you know, more more uh, familiar with with these concepts, these these sites, the the the, uh, the the different names for things. The easier it's going to be for you to get so much more out of this trip. Uh, so so that's the idea here. Is um, we're not going to, you know, I'd love to give you a more comprehensive history of Egypt, but uh, I'm going to try to compress, you know, maybe 24 hours of material down to about one hour. And uh, we'll do, so we're gonna go really fast, but um, I think that it'll be helpful for you because of the, uh, the concepts I'm going to touch on are things that you'll see again and again on our tours. And you know, a lot of the things we're gonna show here, these, these are pictures that I took you know, when I've been in Egypt. And so these are the, for the most part, these are things you're gonna see. There are a couple of pictures I've taken at different places like the Metropolitan Museum in New York. Uh, there are a couple of pictures I took from the University of Utah exhibit. Um, but for the most part, this is stuff you're going to see on our tour. And just to give you an overview of the ancient history of Egypt, you're familiar with some of these names, the Old Kingdom, the Middle Kingdom, the New Kingdom. So just to kind of orient you to, to, to begin with, the Old Kingdom, that's what we uh, think of with the pyramids. Okay. Um, then there are intermediate periods between each of these kingdoms. The intermediate periods are times basically when uh, the civilization in Egypt collapsed. Okay, so you know maybe you don't have a central government. They they talk about it as a time of chaos and darkness. Um, sometimes maybe people are kind of breaking up into local tribes. Uh, maybe they're foreign rulers that have taken over. And so that's what happens when you have intermediate periods. And one of the fascinating things about Egypt is this is a civilization that fully collapsed three times and came back. There's probably no civilization in history that did that, that, you know, once you collapse, that's usually it, right? But for Egypt, they kept coming back. Um, it's just such a, a fascinating and, and really powerful culture. Not only did they come back, but then other people wanted to copy what they were doing. You know, they were, they were so influential. Uh, you know, the Greeks and the Romans, you know, would look back to Egypt uh, for, for their wisdom and, you know, science and, um, you know, you know, architecture. So uh, the Middle Kingdom then, uh, this essentially is, you know, is known as a period of stabilization, trying to, you know, get their feet back under them. Um, artistic flourishing, uh, poetry. Uh, and then there's the second intermediate period uh, with the Hyksos, which were foreign rulers. And we'll talk about those a little later. Then the New Kingdom. Uh, some of the popular figures during the New Kingdom were Hatshepsut, Tutankhamun, Ramses the Great, uh, and then there was another intermediate period when uh, Libyans were uh, in charge. Uh, Nubians uh, later uh, took control. And then the late period, uh, the Sayite dynasty, uh, the Persians. Um, around about here, the, the, the Egyptians themselves kind of lose control of their own country. Other people come in and take over. And like I said, it's such an influential um, culture that even these foreigners, when they would come into Egypt, they wanted to be pharaohs. They wanted to uh, adopt the religious practices and customs. And so it's, it's fascinating to see how even when you have the, uh, when the Greeks come in, um, you know, they, they, they build Egyptian temples. Um, so we end with the Ptolemaic period. Um, that's, that's with the rule of the Greeks that ends with Cleopatra. And, and that's where the Egyptian civilization finally falls apart, and we don't see uh, a reflourishing of, of, of you know, old Egypt. Uh, and, and Egypt actually then is, is really dominated by foreign powers up until modern times, like uh, 19, I think it's 1956 when the British, uh, when they, uh, Egypt you know, established its independence from the British. So um, that's an overview. Um, there's Egypt. Uh, you know, think about this as we as we go through and, and talk about um, uh, these uh, events and, and places. Um, up here, you can see the pointer 
Uh, there's Alexandria established, you know, during that late period. Well, not late period, the, the, the Ptolemaic period, uh, the latest of those you know, periods. Uh, there's Cairo. Um, it says Al Giza. That's where uh, that's where Giza is. And then as you move down, we're going to our tour is going to go all the way down here to Abu Simbel. And during the time that we're going to be discussing Egypt, you know, Egypt's southern border was basically here. There's Aswan. And uh, if you go up here, here's Luxor. So Luxor, uh, that was sort of the religious center uh, known as Thebes. And then if we move up into here, uh, in this area, there was, that's about where Memphis was. And Memphis was kind of the administrative head. And at, at different times, you know, the, the, the different areas, Memphis or Thebes, uh, had, you know, more or less relative power. Uh, but those are some of the main areas that we're going to touch on. And, then, you know, when you go down to Luxor, we go to the other side of the, uh, the Nile there, you see the Valley of the Kings. We'll talk about that quite a bit. Um, but the early history, we go up here, um, you know, a little bit south there of Giza. There's this area in here where Memphis was and then also Saqqara. Okay, and we'll be talking about that in just a minute. But one of the, the first things to think about is how this land was divided in, in the early time, you know, before, you know, when we, we think about Egypt and ancient Egypt, uh, you know, anciently, you, you had, you know, these different tribes. They started to kind of coalesce, and you had two lands. They called them Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt. And Upper, so you have to think about this backwards, okay? Because when we think Upper, we're thinking North, right? Upper refers to the, the South, right? It, re, it, re, it refers to the, uh, the way in which the Nile flows, okay? So the direction of the Nile is, you know, it's coming from down here. It's way down. Um, you have the Nile, and um, I'm forgetting the other the other river that, that joins into the Nile. Um, boy, is it down in Ethiopia, and then comes all the way up through Sudan, um, and then ends up in the, the the Delta area here. So you see how this area where it fans out, it forms kind of a triangle, which is the Greek letter Delta. So the Greeks notice this. And, you know, this is forming a triangle, and they called it the delta area. So since that time, whenever you have water that's going and flowing out into different, uh, you know, uh, arms of, of, of the river, we call that a delta, and that's, that's why. Um, so the, the upper Egypt is to the south. Uh, lower Egypt is to the north. And there was, well, two different crowns. For, for Upper and Lower Egypt. So Upper Egypt, uh, we have the white crown. It's kind of a cone, conical in shape there. Um, and then Lower Egypt, it's known as the Deshret, or the red crown. Okay. And then when these two crowns, when these two lands are, are um, combined and come together, we see the crowns combined. So here you see the conical crown laid inside the, uh, the red crown. Okay, so the white crown and the red crown, and and so you'll see them, 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 so you'll see them. Those where you see when you'll have the cobra sticking out of the front. So there there are different kinds, and and interestingly, you never find a crown in any archaeological dig. All of the tombs that we found never find a crown. We find them illustrated on temple walls. Uh, one theory about that is that the crown may have been something that's passed down uh, from person to person. You know, maybe it wears out, and then you have to throw that one away and you know, make a new one or something. Um, but nobody's buried with a crown. Uh, they're, they're not, for whatever reason, not in any tombs. But we know what they look like from illustrations like this. So this, uh, is, called, this is called a pallet. This is, a, this is the kind of thing that would be used to mix makeup on. Okay, the, the, the Egyptians are really into their makeup, right? So when you see in the movies with all the black eyeliner and stuff like that, that's for real. They really, they really did that. They would use, you know, the, the, one of the theories is, is that maybe this little circle area here was used to kind of crush up their makeup for, you know, eyeliner and such. Uh, but the thing that's really fascinating about this particular palette, it, it might not have been used for makeup at all because what it's doing is it's telling a story. And it, it may be the 
uh, the oldest historical document that exists. This is called the Narmer Palette. Okay, and we'll be able to see this at the Egyptian Museum. There are two sides to this. And it, now this one on the left is actually a, 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 um, a, a recreation of the original. The one that's under glass here is the original. These, these recreations, I think you can see these in you know, some of the different museums around the world. Uh, but the original's right there. And there are two sides to it. And unfortunately, uh, mostly what you're seeing there is the, uh, the, the reflection of me with my camera taking a picture of this. <laughs> Um, but if, uh, if you could see that a little better, what you'd see is you'd see Normer, okay? And he's holding up his mace to go bash somebody's head, and he's got somebody by the hair, and he's going to hit there. He's got the conical crown on in this illustration. On the other side, you'll see up here, you've got all these dead bodies, and they're all decapitated. Uh, you see Normer with the Deshret crown, the lower, the crown of lower Egypt. Okay, and so what this is doing is this is telling the story of how Narmer conquered Egypt. And he brought the two lands together, unified under a central government. Now, some people, uh, on some, some of the pharaoh lists, they'll list Menes as the first pharaoh. Others list Narmer. So because of that, some people think Menes and Narmer is the same person. But you'll, you'll have some of these uh, pharaoh lists. Uh, one of them is in the uh, temple at... Um, uh, uh, Abydos, I think, that, that we won't be seeing. But you know, on the long, along the wall, you'd have this list of the pharaohs, and some people don't make the list, even though we think they actually were pharaohs. So, so it's kind of political. Um, it's not entirely reliable, uh, but uh, you know, we believe that this is the history of the of the of the of the of the of the of the. Uh, just such an important, you know, historical document that we'll be able to see when we get there. So this was the beginning of the Old Kingdom. And uh, one, of the, uh, one of the really fascinating things we'll see is uh, th this building. This is the largest, oldest stone structure in the world. Okay, now, there are some stone structures that are uh, older. Um, the uh, temples uh, at... Um, uh, uh, oh, the uh, island off the coast of uh, Italy. Um, I'm forgetting the name of it. No, um, no, no. It's 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 its own country. Um, starts with an M. No, I'm forgetting. It. Anyway, uh, those those temples are are older. Um, maybe the oldest stone buildings. This stone building is the the oldest um, large building made of stone. Um, and uh, it, it, the, the development of this architecture is, is fascinating because you remember when John Turner or John Thompson spoke to us a few weeks ago about mastabas, okay? Uh, those were the, you know, kind of uh, shoebox shaped uh, tombs, okay? Uh, those are in this area. This is, this is at Saqqara. And so this was a royal burial ground. And Archaeologists think that this, this practice goes back to the time where, um, you know, in, in prehistory, you'd maybe bury your dead in the sand, okay? And with that really dry sand, it could suck out all of the moisture, you know, really well. And they noticed that what it was doing is it was preserving these bodies. They were basically, they were basically mummified as they're, they're buried in the sand. And so, you know, they, they felt like that this was, this was really useful you know, for people who's, I mean, it's, it's unclear how far back they, they had this concept of resurrection. Um, but, you know, they figure that you've got to preserve that body to be resurrected. Your spirit's going to come back into that body. So it's got to be, you know, good enough for you. So they try to preserve it. Well, what was happening, though, is that you, you, you bury a body in the sand and the jackals are going to come. Right. Which is, which is interesting, too, because you think about the jackal headed God, Anubis, who is the he's the God that's preparing the body for mummification. Uh, so you can you can see where that idea comes from, because they see these, you know, burials and they see the jackals hanging out around these bodies. Well, they figured out how to recreate that mummification process of of taking out all the moisture They you know, use salts and other spices. Um, and when we think of a mummy, you know, we think about the, the wrappings. Really, the mummification process has a lot more to do with removing some of the internal organs, drying the body out, 
and and then you wrap it. And you remember John Gee talked about maybe you'd put you know put some some amulets in there, so symbols that would protect uh, the body for the time of resurrection. Um, so Malta, Malta. Sorry, that's from the internet. Yeah, I knew I knew it started with an M. Yeah, the temples at Malta. I want to go there sometime. So maybe you know after we're done in Egypt, we can go to Malta. Um, so uh, so what they did. If they said, this, this sand burial thing's not working. Let's put them in a stone structure. So you have these kind of shoebox-shaped stone structures where there were tombs, and they would bury people there. Well, um, King uh, Zoser uh, and his, his architect, Imhotep, got the, uh, got the idea that we're going to we're gonna go beyond what anybody else has before, and we're not only going to have one mastaba, we're going to stick another mastaba on top of it. And then, you know, you can imagine Imhotep saying, I can do better than that. And he's going to put another mastaba on top of it. And then another one. Okay, so the, the concept here is that we've got these shoebox-shaped things. Let's start stacking. And it's going to be just brilliant. And, 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 and Imhotep, you know, Imhotep's a fascinating figure because Imhotep's probably a name you're familiar with, right? So you know, you know these, these pharaohs, there's Ramses, there's Tutankhamun, and we know Imhotep. You know, who in the world is Imhotep? Well, he's, he's the mummy, you know, in the, uh, what is it, like 1933 film? Uh, and, then, and then Brendan Fraser, 1999, 99, 99, 99, 99, 99, 99, 99, 99, 99, 99, 99, 99, 99, 99, 99, 99, 99, 99, 99, 99, 99, 99, 99, 99, 99, 99, 99, that uh, he, 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 they, they saw him as, uh, well, he was, he was a priest uh, at the, uh, the temple um, at, uh, oh, was it Heliopolis? Yeah, he was a priest of Ra at Heliopolis. He was also thought of, and this, this maybe is you know, propaganda after the fact, but thought of as being a, uh, a great author, uh, a great physician or scientist. Um, so this, this mystique, grew up around Imhotep, and I think largely because people were so darn impressed with what he did here. He was just such a brilliant architect that um, uh, just this, uh, uh, these, these traditions and stories rose up around him, and that eventually, 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 he designed this pyramid, and it became the model for subsequent buildings. And uh, so then, um, a couple generations later, we, uh, oh, oh let, let me mention too, uh, one of the theories is, is that some of these temples originally were uh, maybe more organic. You, you have maybe trees, and maybe you have bound uh, papyrus reeds, and um, that, uh, you know, you have, you know, a structure that's made out of uh, you know, plants. Well, at Saqqara, you can see these uh, columns, and you, you see how they're, they're, they're ribbed like you have bound a bunch of papyrus reeds together, okay? So often, when you go to these Egyptian temples, you'll see these columns that look like this, and sometimes you'll see kind of papyrus flowers at the top or leaves. The idea is, is that these are plants, and that as you're walking through one of these colonnades or hypostyle halls, that this is as though you're walking through a garden. And it's often in one of the uh, entranceways, one of the, the uh, four um, courtyards, so that it, 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 so that it. That's what they're doing with architecture, is they're imitating some of the plants, but then, you know, these things last thousands more years. Okay, one of the other things that, um, well, uh, we're going we're to shift to Sneferu now, um, who took what Imhotep and Zoser did and went beyond that. But one of the things that, uh, that Sneferu is, is kind of known for, now there were cartouches before Sneferu here and there, but Sneferu really kind of solidified this practice. So when you see one of these circular... Um, well, kind of oval-shaped items. And this is, this is from one of the tombs in uh, the Valley of the Kings, and you can see up there where you've got these, uh, these two circles. What it is is this rope. That's, that's a little bit easier to see what it is. You've got rope that's encircling a name, 
Okay? And when you see that, what that is, is that's the name of a pharaoh. And the idea is, is that this circle is protecting the name of the person or protecting the person whose name is written in there. Okay? So um, uh, th this is, uh, when you see those, you know, that's what you're seeing. And, you know, it's called a cartouche. That's what uh, the French gave it that name because, uh, you know, when Napoleon came, you know, he's got his armies. Um, they, they said, boy, that really looks like one of these little, uh, you know, things we're sticking in our guns. You know, it's, it's, it's packed with uh, gunpowder and balls and you put it down into your gun. And that's, you know, a cartridge or a cartouche. Okay, so that's where the name comes from. Um, but uh, Sneferu was, uh, was one that really made these popular. Now, the other thing that Sneferu did is, is he thought, you know, I'm going to take this pyramid building thing to the next level. Okay. And um, I don't have a picture of his first pyramid that looks a little bit more like a tower. Uh, but this is second, third. And you'll be able to see these off in the distance when we're at Saqqara. And on the left side there, it's what's called the bent pyramid. Okay. So Sneferu is kind of experimenting here. He's doing the best he can. But he says, you know, it'd be really cool, wouldn't it, if we, if we could make these pyramids, you know, instead of the step pyramid, we'll, we'll, we'll have smooth sides all the way along. And so he starts out with this, with this bent pyramid, and the base of it is larger than the base of the pyramid, Great Pyramid of Giza. And if he would have been able to finish this one, it would have been, it would have been the largest structure in the world. It would have been bigger than the Pyramid of Giza. Um, but it started to crumble. It started to fall in, uh, collapse. It wasn't, it wasn't on a solid foundation. And so he thought, oh, we got to save this thing somehow. And so he, he, he alters the, the angle brings it in a little bit and still didn't help but that's why it looks that's why it looks so funny is because and that's why they call it the bent pyramid it's going like this it goes like this and then they think ah, let's start over so they move across the street and they build the red pyramid okay now the red pyramid not as big but you know a more successful effort and uh it was uh it was the the, the, the best thing in town for a while and then khufu Who's Snefru's son came along and he thought, I gotta outdo dad. And so he's the one that builds the Great Pyramid. Okay. Uh, also, also known as Cheops. Okay, the Greeks called Khufu Cheops. Um, so this was the tallest structure in the world for about 3,800 years. Uh, it wasn't until the, the, the taller structure that that uh, that beat it was Lincoln Cathedral in uh, in Great Britain in about 1311. Okay, well, Lincoln Cathedral, the, what it was is it had a huge spire on it, and uh, that thing collapsed. Okay, so, so it lost its place in, in tallest buildings in the world. Um, you know, later, you know, we have to go to something like the Eiffel Tower, um, or, or maybe the cathedral at Cologne, maybe uh, was, was built sooner. But, uh, but, but you think about how long it was before somebody built something taller, and it's just, you, you can understand why this is one of the wonders of the world, right? Um, I, I don't want to disappoint anybody. Sometimes I come back from Egypt and they say, did you go inside the pyramid? And, and did it, you know, what did it feel like? Okay, it's not magic. Um, uh, people, you can find stuff on the internet about this. It's, it's hilarious. They talk about how you can, you know, take meat inside and put it inside the pyramid. It'll be preserved and it won't, it won't rot. Um, no, it won't. It, it will rot. Um, they talk about how it's you know made of quartz, and so the, the, it's it's uh, sending signals out into space, um, or just that the, the the shape of the pyramid has some kind of mystical power. Okay, the Egyptians didn't even believe this. Okay, they they don't place any kind of mystical power belief in the shape of the pyramid. Okay, they they they, they abandon this shape eventually. I mean, this was just you know when we go back and we see. You know, we're stacking mastabas on top of each other. It's not too hard to see where this concept comes from and, and the evolution of the design. And, and it really has nothing to do with, uh, uh, you know, some kind of a, a belief in the mythical power of, of this pyramid. Although there are some really interesting uh, traditions and, and uh, you know, uh, legends that, that come up around this. You have, you have the idea of Napoleon going and he says he wants to spend the night, you know, in the burial chamber and, he goes in there and comes out the next day white as a ghost, and he won't tell anybody why. He won't, you know, won't, won't say what he saw. And so that's one of the great mysteries of history is, you know, what did Napoleon see when he spent the night in there? Um, the sarcophagus that's in there, it's the only thing in there. You go into the burial tomb, and it's this 
big stone empty box. Okay, it's you don't have illustrations on the walls. Um, there's just there's not really anything in there. I mean, I'd go. I mean, I did go. I, I'm not going to go again. There's 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 nothing to see. But if you haven't been in there, I recommend it. Um, but uh, just so you can say you've been in there, right? But you know, you'll get in there and, and you'll say, ah, there's nothing here. But one of the interesting things is is that sarcophagus is larger than the doorway. So they had to build the pyramid around the sarcophagus uh, because, you know, <laughs> they couldn't have gotten it in any other way. So um, that's kind of interesting. But, um, oh, let's see. Um, the, the, uh, the Sphinx, then, is, is, is kind of interesting. So uh, Chefrin or Khafre, um, then they think what happened is this, they're, they're clearing off this plateau in Giza, and they get to this spot where there's this enormous rock. And they think, what are we going to do with this thing? They think, I know, we'll carve a sculpture out of it. And they think that maybe uh, Khafre's face is uh, the face of the Sphinx, the body of a lion. Um, and, uh, you know, there, there are interesting stories about uh, the Sphinx. Uh, you know, there's a the tradition that... Uh, Napoleon's army blew the nose off the Sphinx with its cannons, you know, for target practice. Um, not true. Um, we know that that's not true because there are illustrations of the Sphinx that predate Napoleon where the nose is gone. Uh, so we know that the nose disappeared before there. They think probably just erosion, you know, wind blowing it. This thing, this thing would get covered by sand, um, you know, so there's, uh, you know, it's been there for thousands of years, right? Um, it would have had a, a false beard, uh, you know, the, the, the false beard, the pharaohs, you know, that they would wear. Uh, you can tell because, well, for one thing, we've got, uh, you know, something up here showing where, you know, they would show a, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the strings holding the beard. But we also know because they've got the beard. Uh, it's in two parts, and you know, one of them is sitting in a back room somewhere in the Egyptian museum. The other one's in London in the British Museum. And, uh, you know, so anyway, that's, uh, it, it would have looked, you know, quite a bit different than it does now. Um, so when you go into the Great Pyramid, you won't see anything on the walls. But a little, a little bit after that, um, Unas, who was a pharaoh, uh, a little bit after, uh, you know, Shefren, uh, uh, he uh, decided that it would be a good idea, you know, when his spirit is coming back to find his body to be resurrected, if he would write instructions on the walls, so his spirit could read the instructions, that would help him to know. Uh, some of the instructions are talking about how how the body will be protected, okay, and some of the instructions are talking about how to make the voyage to the west, okay. The west is where the dead are, and and so in order to make that voyage, you know, they, they talk about getting in a boat, going through this boat, and going through gates, and you have to know the the uh, the, 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 the passwords to, to pass the sentinels at these gates to make your way into the land of the dead. And then the, the third section of these would talk about how to be accepted into the spirit world, um, you know, how to become a god, okay, how to become deified. Um, and so this is called a pyramid text. And, um, you know, the pharaoh, he's got all his instructions in there, okay? Now, uh, oh, there's an Egyptian goddess, <laughs> uh, we might see her when we go to Egypt. Um, so then things fall apart. Okay? Now, there are different theories about why they fell apart. Some people think that there were a, a number of periods of drought or, with low Nile periods. Other people think that uh, maybe it had something to do with the fact that you know, the pharaoh Pepe, Pepe uh, was just too old. Um, you had this, this ceremony where Pepe would, would run around the uh, courtyard at, um, at uh, Saqqara and, you know, to, to, to show that he's strong and that he's the, he's the mighty pharaoh and can't be defeated in battle. And then as he gets into his 90s, it just wasn't as easy as it used to be, right? And, and that, that maybe people started to lose respect for this, this pharaoh that was so old that he's just, he's just not going to be able to be the kind of fierce warrior that he used to be. So there's those, there are those theories. Maybe it's both, right? But in any event... Uh, nobody wants to follow the Pharaoh anymore. Things fall apart. Um, it's a period of darkness and chaos. Okay, now, one of the interesting things about that, and again, so much of what you hear about uh, with Egyptian history is that there's theories, and, and some theories become popular, and then somebody says, no, that one's not true because of this. 
you know, if we got a, a room of Egyptologists together, uh, there would be very little agreement on, on about anything. You know, somebody's going to disagree. Um, but this is, this is a really interesting idea, I think, is that during the first intermediate period, uh, people got the gumption to go and break into the tombs of these pharaohs. And so they would get into one of these tombs, and they see he's got all the instructions for how to you know, protect the body and how to, to make your way through the spirit world. I want those too. And so uh, the, the, the more common people would, would, would start to uh, commandeer these instructions, and you have what's called the coffin texts. And so this is the inside of one of the coffins. This is actually one that I took at the, the Metropolitan Museum. If you're coming through New York, by the way, uh, Heather and I had a layover for 10, uh, 12 hours or so at New York when we were coming back from Egypt. So we thought it would be great to go to the Metropolitan Museum and see their Egyptian collection right after coming back. And, and it is a great thing to do. So if you, if you happen to be coming or going through New York and you have a big layover, um, that's a great way to spend your time. So uh, this, this is the inside of a coffin. It's, again, teaching the spirit what they need to do to be able to make their way through the spirit world. Um, you can see this, this individual is being washed right there, you know. Um, then, uh, I mean, if you don't have the money to write it into, you know, on, on your coffin, or you don't have the money to buy a coffin, uh, let's put it on papyrus, okay? And so we have what's called the Books of the Dead, okay, or a Book of Breathings. Um, later, there's a different variation called Book of Gates. Um, and so you would um, write down on these papyri, the instructions you need to be able to make your way through the spirit world. All right, so Middle Kingdom. Um, Middle Kingdom, uh, this is considered Egypt's classical age. This may have been the period where Abraham lived. Okay, um, so there's, frankly, there's, there's not a lot that we can really point to, um, uh, you know, beyond that. Um, I mean, if you're really into, uh, you know, Egyptian, you know, love poetry or, uh, you know, stories, I, you know, some of that's coming out of this period. Um, but then we get into the second intermediate period and we have the Hyksos. Now, Hyksos are a you know, fascinating group because some people think that this is, uh, you know, maybe Jacob and Jacob's sons. OK, now I think the chronology doesn't work out, you know, for these to be, you know, actual uh, Hebrews. But, uh, but it is interesting. Uh, they do come from, you know, the Levant. They come, they're, they're Semitic. They're a Semitic tribe. Uh, Josephus refers to them as shepherd kings, which is, you know, probably not accurate. They're probably more accurately called foreign kings. Uh, but they were Semitic. They introduced horses and chariots into uh, Egypt, which becomes really significant later. Um, but we don't know a lot about them, of course, because the history is written by the victors, right? Eventually, the Egyptians kick the Hyksos out, and um, so, you know, the Egyptians are writing the history, and uh, they don't really care to talk about the times when they were taken over by foreign rulers. Um, but, uh, but it is interesting. They do settle up in the, uh, in the Delta area, which is the same location where we, uh, we find uh, the story of the Bible taking place with, you know, Moses and, you know, settling in the land of Goshen. Um, so Hyksos are, you know, interesting, interesting group. Um, it at least lets us know that there is this, uh, you know, uh, interplay between, you know, the land of Canaan and Egypt. And, you know, there's, there's a lot going on between those areas. Now, the New Kingdom, uh, this, is, this is where all the action is. You know, we, we, built, we built the pyramids back in the Old Kingdom, but, you know, most of the characters that you hear about and, you know, a lot of the real you know, action-packed stuff is going on in the New Kingdom. So uh, this starts with uh, Thutmosis the first, where he he gets the bright idea of hiding his his tomb. Um, you know all these pyramids. You know it's like they have big neon signs saying "Rob me." You know the the gold is here, and and so Thutmose says, "I know. I'm going to go where nobody goes. Okay, we're going to go into the desert. He's going on the west side of the Nile. Okay, remember because that's where the dead are." And he's going to go into this desolate area. When, you, when we go to the Valley of the Kings, man, you, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll see how uh, nobody's going to want to live there. Um, it's just uh, barren and dry. Nothing grows there. And so he says, this is perfect. 
We're going to tunnel down in 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 below. We're not going to build 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 down to the ground. Okay, so this is a picture of one of them. Um, well, let's not go to her yet. All right, so Tutmosis the first. Um, he uh, he starts building large obelisks. Uh, he's, a couple of his his obelisks are at Karnak, um, and and this you know locating his tomb down here in Thebes, starting to you know build things at Karnak. That really starts to elevate the importance of Thebes, okay, or Luxor. Um, and so this is the period where that becomes really important. Now, uh, Thutmosis, this is, this is so fascinating, and I, I wish I would have drawn up a, a diagram for you because it's so hard to follow, uh, where we have this uh, succession of kings. And one of the things, I guess, just to keep in mind is that uh, if you're a woman in Egypt, um, you, you're going you're gonna to be a lot more powerful than you would be if you were in Greece or Rome or, or anywhere else in the world, right? In the, in the ancient world, the women just didn't, didn't have any power. In Egypt, uh, you, could, you, could, you could put together some power, barely, um, okay? Uh, but it was kind of tricky. Um, and so it depends a lot upon, um, you know, who you're descended from. And, and that, the same is true for men. Uh, you know, a man just can't become pharaoh uh, overnight. Uh, and, and sometimes he has to marry the right woman, okay? So uh, what happened is Thutmose didn't have any male heirs, okay? And so much of this, now they, had, they would sometimes have multiple wives, and uh, the important thing is, is who's descended from the first wife, or the great wife, okay? In this case, it was a girl named Hatshepsut, okay? Now, Hatshepsut, uh, you, know, she's, you know, she's about uh, 12 years old when her, her father dies, uh, leaving her in line for the succession, but she's a woman, and so it's it's kind of a problem. Um, so uh, Thutmosis the second is the son of one of the of the lesser wives, and so uh, he marries Hatshepsut, which puts him you know more into the uh, you know the, the seat of authority. Um, but then. He dies after about 20 years. Nothing really happens during this period, um, including having a male heir. Um, and so what, what ends up happening is um, Thutmosis III was the son of one of the secondary wives. And so, you know, he's got a claim on the throne, but um, uh, he's, he's a little kid at this point. And so Hatshepsut begins to uh, act as the regent. He shows she, she's going to be in charge, sort of holding you know, a place for Thutmosis III, uh, while he maybe, there are different theories about this, maybe he's going off being trained to be a great you know, soldier. Um, maybe she's just kind of taking over and asserting her authority, because eventually what she does is she says, I am the pharaoh. And uh, in order to do this, uh, you know, she puts on the beard. And, uh, you know, so she starts to dress like the men are dressing, you know, with the, the royal regalia um, and literally calls herself a man in, in some of the uh, in the texts that you'll read in, in, uh, on some of the walls. Um, and uh, so there's there's this sort of uh, assumption of power. And she recognizes, you know, that she's need. Now, they, they, now they know she's a woman, um, you know, but but it's almost like. Um, you know, she needs to take on the, the air of authority. So she's got to wear the things that the guy that's in charge wears, and she's got to be called the same kind of things the guy's in charge is called. And so she becomes a very powerful leader in Egypt. Uh, she makes, uh, you know, I, I wonder if she's maybe made the most obelisks uh, of anybody. Um, you know, so she was, she was a builder um, and, uh, you know, highly influential. Um, but uh, eventually, uh, well, oh, and she, she builds just, oh, there, there's some sculptures of her, and, and you know, the, uh, the Egyptian museum on the, on the, the right there, uh, this is their signature piece. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a sculpture of uh, Hatshepsut. Um, they're so proud that they have this. If you go to the Met, there's this whole room 
with just these beautiful, beautiful sculptures of Hatshepsut. Um, they're just, <laughs> the whole room, it's, it's a room bigger than this room. It's just filled with these sculptures. And, and uh, what happened, there, there, there's her temple at uh, Delabari, um, just striking in its architecture. Uh, I mean, you can see this kind of architecture, um, you know, today, you know, people trying to copy this kind of thing. I mean, this was just such a stunning, I and mean, then this is in, you know, well, just, just, you know, near the Valley of the Kings. Um, and, uh, you know, really, really, uh, this, this whole thing was just such a beautiful complex. Um, so uh, what ended up happening, though, is that when Thutmosis, you know, kind of comes of age, um, you know, he, well, Hatshepsut dies, he becomes king. And um, one, of the, one of the thoughts is, is that he, he maybe married um, Hatshepsut's um, daughter. Uh, and that would more solidify you know, his claim because you have kind of these, the, a whole line of women who are really first in line, uh, but then kind of men marrying to kind of solidify their claim. You know, except for Hatshepsut. She, she, she does that. She ends up in that marriage with Thutmosis II, but then he dies and she says, you know, I'm it. Um, so anyway, through Moses, then um, he he takes over and he he becomes the most revered, powerful uh, uh, military leader in Egyptian history. Um, very widely considered to be the greatest um, warrior king, um, and this goes on for a number of years. He's he's Pharaoh for for quite a while, but then um, at some point later in his reign. For some reason, it's not really clear why, he starts to just wipe out any indication that Hatshepsut even existed. Okay, so he's going in and, um, you know, carving over her cartouche so you don't see it. Um, going in and, you know, taking her name off of her obelisks. Uh, this, was, this was a difficult thing, apparently, at, at Karnak. So when we go to Karnak, you'll see one of the biggest, you know, tallest obelisks there was one of Hatshepsut's obelisks. And for whatever reason, instead of just toppling the thing over and you know smashing it up, they built a wall <laughs> up up around it so that people couldn't read that this was Hatshepsut's obelisk. And uh, and they took they took so many of her statues. She just had you know so so many of these beautiful statues, especially around there at Darabari, her temple. Uh, they, they 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 broke them up, smashed them, uh, throw them into a pit. Uh, fortunately, uh, archaeologists found them, and, and here you can see, you know, so many of the cracks in this because it's been, you know, all all broken up, and they're able to put these things back together, and now you have this room with some really really beautiful statues, but they wanted to kind of wipe out the uh, uh, memory of Hatshepsut, um, and so that's that's what happened. Now, uh, through Moses, then, uh, you know, one of the really important battles that where he made his name was the Battle of Megiddo. And Megiddo is that area where, you know, everybody is kind of coming and going through Megiddo. It's this valley where you're going to go up to Syria. you got to come through there. You're going to go down to Egypt. you got to go through there. And so um, battles would often take place in that area. And so it became kind of symbolic for this battlefield, kind of a quintessential battlefield. And so that's why we have in the book of Revelation, John talking about the great battle that's going to be at Har Megiddo or Armageddon. Okay, um, now uh, Thutmose then goes to do battle with Canaanites at the Valley of Megiddo, and there are about three different areas where you can get into this valley. And uh, everybody tells Thutmose that uh, well, you you got to go, you know, pick door number one or door number three, but don't pick door number two. And he says, why not? Why shouldn't I pick door number two? They say because door number two is too narrow. You go through door number two. And what the, the phrase the phrase is is um, you've got to go man behind man, horse behind horse. Okay, so they're going kind of single file through this this valley to get into Megiddo. And he says, "That's a great idea. That's what I'm going to do, because nobody will expect it." And so he does, and he goes through, and nobody expected it. And he brings his his army into Megiddo, and he's able to just beat up on the Canaanites that were there. Um, but then his, 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 his army gets, uh, they, they get greedy and they start to pillaging 
the bodies of, of these Canaanites, and, and so uh, they weren't able to completely rout them. And what ended up happening is the Canaanites retreat up into this fortress in Megiddo, and they have to hold them there for about seven months. But eventually, Thutmosis takes it over, and uh, it's, it's, it, it is just uh, a, a, an enormous victory for him, um, and you know, kind of his claim to fame. So uh, he had a lengthy reign, um, and then there was a second co-regency as he became old. Uh, his son, Amenhotep II, uh, reigned with him while he was really too old to uh, you know, learn, learn the lesson of Pepi, I guess. And uh, so Amenhotep is uh, then succeeded by Thutmose IV. Okay, now, Thutmose IV probably had a weak claim on the throne. The reason we say that is if you go to the Sphinx, okay, you'll see this. Uh, this little stella. Okay, now a stella is a stone that has stuff written on it. Okay, and so we'll we'll talk more about stella, stellae, stellae in in a minute. Uh, this one in particular tells a story about uh, it, it, it tells it tells a story about a dream. Okay, and that um, Thutmose the fourth, you know, he falls asleep under the Sphinx, and the Sphinx speaks to him. And tells because the Sphinx is covered in sand at this point, like up to his neck. And so he's down, you know, sleeping under the, the head of the Sphinx. And the Sphinx says, if you'll uncover me, then you will become king of Egypt. Now, um, th th this may just suggest that he didn't really have a great claim to the throne. And he wanted to create some kind of a, you know, mythical, magical, uh, you know, experience that established that he's the true king. And so he did uncover it and, you know, stuck a little Stella down there to tell the story so everybody would know that he's the rightful king. Now, this Stella is uh, one that was that, that replaced the original Stella. Uh, so that's not the one that he put there. But, uh, but you know, makes for a good story. Um, now, his son uh, was another of the great pharaohs of Egypt, Amenhotep III. Okay? Now, Amenhotep III, uh, again, made Luxor or, or um, Thebes uh, one of the really great, uh, important cities, you know, by, you know, building more there, um, large-scale building programs. Now, uh, one of the things that we'll see there is uh, the remains of what was the greatest temple in the world. Uh, now, uh, today, Karnak is the largest temple uh, complex in the world. Um, now, at the time, though, this was larger than Karnak, and uh, then there was an earthquake that happened fairly, fairly soon after everything was built, and it just demolished the place. Um, now, when we go there, you'll see, we just drive past, well, we'll stop to look at these, uh, these two statues, but uh, you'll see there is an effort to start uh, putting things back together, and it'll be really interesting to see over the years what they do with this, because there's just so much back there. Uh, it was an enormous complex, but... Uh, these statues remain um, uh, after that uh, initial earthquake. And um, over time, some mythology rose up around these statues. Uh, what happened, you know, when the you know, Greek tourists are coming through here. So around about, um, oh, I don't know, somewhere around the time of Christ, um, 27 B.C., um, there's this whistle sound that develops with these, with the, you know, you can see all these cracks in these, uh, in these statues. Well, what would happen, they say, is at dawn, uh, is, you know, just probably because of the way the, the wind is blowing at dawn, there'd be these, this whistling sound that would come from these, these statues. And so they, uh, they associated that with, well, they, you know, they, they, call, they call them the singing statues um, of Memnon. Okay, now, uh, Memnon is a, uh, a character with the Trojan War. Uh, his mother is uh, Eos, who was the goddess of the dawn. And so the idea is that as the sun's coming up, that uh, these statues are starting to sing, and they associated that with this myth about Memnon. And so uh, they call these the Colossi of Memnon. Okay, so when we you see on your itinerary, we're, we're visiting the Colossi of Memnon. That's what they are, and that's, that's the story behind them. Now, um, the Egyptian culture is maybe the most conservative culture that's ever existed. Okay, they, they, they preserved their art over thousands of years, their religion over thousands of years. 
um, you know, so much of, of their culture they, they maintain. Um, and, and so it's just, you know, we, we can go in America back 20 or 30 years and look at the art and, and you know, you can tell it's, you know, it's different. You know, the music is different. Um, in Egypt, so much of this was just, you know, they just plug along for thousands of years, except during one period where the son of Amenhotep III, who was Amenhotep IV, um, he, you know, I, I think of him as the hippie pharaoh, okay? So, you know, he didn't really want, he wasn't really cool with, you know, what his dad is doing, and, you know, he wants to do his own thing. Um, and so he decides that he is going to rock the boat, and he comes up with, uh, well, he changes the religious uh, orientation so that instead of worshiping all these gods, you know, Ra and Osiris and Isis, we're going to focus on one. It was, it was a god that existed, but, you know, not many people thought about him, and really it was just associated with the sun. It was called the Aten, okay? And so he says... The Aten, and he, he writes this hymn to the Aten. He says the Aten is the god of the, all the world. Okay? It's not just the Egyptians. Um, and, you know, we don't have to go to these temples and give all these you know, sacrifices to these priests. We just can, you know, bathe in the glory of the Aten, you know, go out to the sun and, and worship the sun. Um, and so he changes his name from Amenhotep, which means Amun is pleased, to Akhenaten, which means... Um, Akhenaten means effective for the Aten, okay? And uh, the, the priests aren't happy about this because they get all their money from people bringing them stuff to worship at the temples. And, you know, this upsets the political structure. So they run him out of town on rail. And he says, that's okay. I will go into the desert and I will make my own hippie commune out in the desert. We'll, ca we'll call it Amarna. And actually, he called it something else. That was, he went to Amarna, but it was... It, it, he, he named it after Ot, and I can't remember the name of it. But um, he, he makes his own temple out there. And if you go to the, the exhibit at the University of Utah, you'll see this. This is, uh, this is a big model of the temple at Amarna. Okay, and that's one side of it. There's the other side. And what you'll notice if you look at this and you start comparing to other temples, um, now it's kind of hard to say because, uh, you know, a lot of times the roofs have fallen in. But um, temples... Anciently in Egypt, as you move into the temple, it kind of becomes darker and darker as you move toward the Holy of Holies. And then the Holy of Holies itself is the darkest place in the temple. Well, what Aten did, or Akhenaten did, to worship the Aten, you got to have everything open. Okay, you got to be able to see the sun. And so as you look at this model, you can see as you move through this temple... Okay, you've got you know the, the, the outer courtyard where you know other anybody can come into this outer courtyard. Then you've got the inner courtyard. Okay, so you've got you know three different divisions, which is very common with Egyptian temples um, and other temples that we know of. Uh, so you, you move into the next section. The, the priests can go into that section, and then the furthest section in is where the uh, the high priest or the king can go. Uh, but this is open to the sky. Um, so, very, very different approach. The, the art uh, is, is very different. Uh, you'll see sculptures of Akhenaten. Um, it looks almost like it's alien. Um, you know, it looks, looks like some people thought, you know, was, was there something physically wrong with this guy? Because it looks really, really weird. Um, but there's, there's some ways in which it's really beautiful art uh, as well. And, uh, but it's a, it's a broad departure from what they've done in the past. Uh, so, uh, his, his wife... Um, you know, one of the uh, most famous uh, queens of Egypt, uh, Nefertiri. And, uh, you know, Nefertiri, uh, you, you know, one of the most revered works of art in history, you know, the bust of Nefertiri, you can see in the, in the museum in Berlin. Uh, you know, one of the most highly um, uh, copied things, you know, that, that image you see all the time, kind of emblematic of Egypt. And um, they had a son who was named Tukon Aten. Okay? Now, once uh, Akhenaten died, uh, Nefertiri and the son Tukon Aten figure, you know, we better go back to civilization and, 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 and uh, the authorities. And so Tukon Aten's name is changed to Tutankhamun, okay? 
So we're 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 gonna dip 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 and uh so they go back to uh to Thebes and um uh so there's there's the boy king himself uh it doesn't last very long uh he is uh starts ruling at age eight or nine dies about nine years later um his wife was um Ankasanaman, I think was her name. Um, Ankasanaman. Now, uh, he didn't have any kids. He probably had two. Maybe they were stillborn babies. You find two small um, sarcophagi in his, in his tomb. Uh, his tomb is very small, by the way. I, I, I recommend you go. You have to pay a little bit extra to get into Tutankhamun's tomb. Um, it's, it's, it's interesting, uh, especially because it's you know, like the most famous uh, tomb in history. Uh, and the reason for that is that uh, it was hidden um, and probably wasn't his tomb to begin with. What happened is he died before anybody expected it. They're working on, you know, as soon as you become Pharaoh, they start working on a tomb for you. And, you know, the longer you live, the bigger and badder it is, right? Um, Tukhanham didn't live that long. His tomb wasn't finished. So they appropriate a tomb of some noble. Uh, they, they jam all his stuff into there. And... Uh, it ends up getting covered over because other tombs start getting built around it. The uh, entrance is lost. So later, tomb robbers don't find it. So then when we get into it, you find just stunning works of gold. Uh, you know, you've got the death mask here. You've got this golden throne here. Um, but he doesn't, have, he doesn't have a heir. And so what ends up happening is this It goes to um, one of his... One of his uh, uh, maybe military leaders, um, I, um, who uh, pro he may have married Anka Sanaman, the widow, in order to kind of establish his authority. Well, he dies without an heir. And um, Hornheb, who's another one of, uh, he was one of Akhenaten's, you know, in his, in his uh, entourage. Well, um, he dies childless. And... Uh, so they, they finally figure, you know, we better, we better choose a guy now who, you know, has got a good chance of, of having an heir. And Ramses the first comes along, and he's got a son and a grandson. Okay, now Ramses the first doesn't last very long, but at least he's got some heirs. And so uh, he only re rules briefly, but then um, he has a son, Seti the first. Seti the first does live a long time, and he has the biggest tomb in the Valley of the Kings. Now, when we go to the Valley of the Kings, they only have about three of these tombs open at a time. They rotate, okay? Except for Tutankhamun's tombs open all the time, but you got to pay an extra fee to get in there. Uh, so there's no telling which one we're going to go into. Um, I haven't been in Seti's tomb yet. If we're lucky, maybe we'll go into that one. Um, so Seti, you know, he, he built some of the most uh, beautiful monuments in, in Egypt. He began the Hypostyle Hall at Karnak. Um, it look, look at this guy. Just this tiny little guy next to these huge columns. They say that at the top of these columns, you could fit 100 people uh, on top of these things. These, these are just massive. And uh, so Karnak then becomes the largest temple complex in the world. It was over 200 acres. Um, you know, this gives you a little bit of an idea of, of uh, the magnificence of Karnak. Now, uh, Seti's son, Ramses II, or Ramses the Great. Okay. Also a great builder okay? uh, and a great appropriator of other buildings. Yeah. So he goes and you know, chisels out people's names and puts his own in. So sometimes you'll see Ramsey's name dug in kind of deeper than, than other things. And what, what's probably happened there is he's carved his name in where somebody else's was. Uh, but one of the things that Ramsey's was known for is uh, the Battle of Kadesh. Okay. Um, one of these other battles where he's going in against all odds. He, uh, uh, he's going up against the Hittites, the perennial enemy of the Egyptians, and um, they're totally outnumbered. Uh, he, he captures a couple of, of spies, and they say, hey, no problem. You can go in there. The, the Hittites have, have uh, retreated. Okay, well, wasn't true. As he came to find out, is, you know, his, his lead entourage just gets uh, uh, pulverized, and, and, and so... He rallies the troops and ends up pushing the Hittites back over the Orontes River. Uh, you know, the next day they, they fight again 
uh, and, and they're going at it tooth and nail. But uh, what ends up happening, we think, is that they kind of beat each other to a draw. Okay, the Hittites go home, the Egyptians go home, and they both kind of claim victory. Okay, they, they both have their own kind of stories to tell about what happened. And it's very interesting because this is, this is one of the most well-documented battles in history. Uh, so we can read what the Hittites are saying about it. We can read what the, the uh, Egyptians are saying about it. It's not quite the same story, but uh, you can kind of piece together what happened. Um, you know, and so over the next number of years, they, they keep on going out, um, you know, and fighting these, these uh, border, you know, disputes, these battles. Um, eventually, Ramses decides, you know, we got we to bring an end to this. And he negotiates what is known as the first peace treaty in the world. Uh, and this is this is written down on um, uh, by the Hittites. It's written down by the uh, Egyptians, and a copy of this is hanging in the United Nations uh, because you know it's it's seen as being such a significant document as probably being the first peace treaty in the world. So um, now uh, this this particular statue is. In some respects, it's the tallest statue the Egyptians ever built. Okay, it's it's an Abu symbol. It's at the uh, entrance of Abu symbol. Now, the Colossi of Memnon are maybe the tallest freestanding statues, but uh, but these. Oh, uh, when you go into Abu symbol, this is this is uh, an illustration of the uh, the Battle of Kadesh. That's, that's one of the things that uh, Ramses did. Is you know, whenever he build a temple, he wants to put the Battle of Kadesh there to show everybody. You know what a great warrior he was, and truthfully, he probably was really impressive. I mean, he's got all this his uh, his men there with him that would have seen what happened, and you know if he's totally lying about what happens, you know the word would have gotten out. Um, so probably was a pretty impressive warrior. But when we go down to Abu Simbel, you'll see there are two temples there. There's the temple of Ramses, and then there's temple of his wife Nefertari. Okay, uh, and over the top there it says that this is for Shihu. She for whom the sun doth shine. So he really liked Nefertari, made her own temple. Um, didn't like her as much as he liked himself, apparently. The statues are not as tall as, uh, as his, but uh, still a beautiful, very impressive temple. Okay, so this is, this is his temple. And um, fascinating thing about Abu Simbel, I, I, I think this is, this is my favorite place to go in Egypt. Um, I love these temples, and we'll talk about that more when we get there. But... Um, so much interesting history about it, too, in addition to the temple itself. Uh, you can see that one of these statues has fallen. Um, interesting thing about this is the, uh, well, let me come back to that. This gives you a little bit of an idea of what's inside there. Uh, the sunlight will come into the door of Abu Simbel um, two times during the year. They think maybe his birthday and maybe his coronation day where the sun's shining right down this hall. And at the very back of that hall is the Holy of Holies, where you'll have Ramses sitting there with three other gods. And the light is shining right on Ramses on these two days. So the, the temple is very uh, deliberately oriented to do that. There, there's Nefertari's temple. And, and there's some really Im interesting imagery uh, that you'll see in here that, that you may recognize. Um, as you look at some of the hand gestures of people on the walls, some of the embraces. Um, this one's kind of interesting, especially if you went through the temple before about 1991. Uh, as you look at some of the, you know, the ways that they're oriented and you know what they're doing with their feet and their legs. Um, and, and, and this this uh, image, this is uh, he's praying to the god with upraised hands. Um, and so I, I just think it's fascinating to see some of the things in these temples as, you know, as you're moving toward the Holy of Holies and you see these different embraces as the Pharaoh is moving toward becoming a god and then sits with the gods and becomes a god himself. Um, now, the, the whole mountain was going to be covered with water <clears throat> because of the Aswan Dam. Okay. The Aswan Dam created Lake Nasser, covered a lot of archaeological sites. Some were considered more significant than others. Uh, this one was considered particularly significant, so they took it apart. They took the whole mountain apart, and they moved it up the, uh, the beach, like uh, maybe a couple hundred yards or something, so that um, it wouldn't be covered by Lake Nasser. Now, uh, that mountain itself is artificial. It's kind of interesting. If you walk back around, you can see the backside of it. And the whole thing, there's a, there's a uh, thing you can find on the internet where they, you know, somebody's going inside that thing, and it's just, it's just uh, it's open space. 
Um, but the stone is off, that's the original stone for the temple. Okay. Now you, you see that one of these figures, you know, has slid right off. Um, that wasn't because they moved this thing. That 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 statue fell apart like that pretty early. And, and so as they're putting this back together, they're thinking, ah, you know, do we put it back together? Because they could have. You know, they're putting everything else back together. They, just, they deliberately decided to leave it the way it's been for thousands of years, you know, with the head down here at the bottom. Um, you know, I suppose it's kind of like, you know, do you put the arms back on the Venus de Milo, you know? Uh, and, you know, because Abu symbols looked that way for so long, they decided to keep it that way. Um, okay, so uh, Ramses also built the Ramesseum, another you know enormous temple. Interesting thing about this is you look down around it, you'll find these uh, uh, these enclosures made of mud brick. And if you remember, who is it that built things out of mud brick? Uh, the Hebrews, right? The, the Hebrew slaves are building things out of mud brick. Um, so Ramses the second is is often. Uh, associated with the Pharaoh in the Bible, in the Exodus story. Now, the Exodus story doesn't tell us the name of the Pharaoh, but it does tell us that there are a couple of cities, uh, Pi and Ramses. Um, as it turns out, Ramses II did make his capital city a city called Pi Ramses. Okay? Um, and, and you've got these you know, mud brick enclosures um, around there. there. There are a number of things that uh, you know, would, would lend credence to the idea that the story that appears in Exodus is, you know, an authentically Egyptian story, uh, that, that there's so much of there that, that really rings true. Um, I can tell you more about that when we get to Egypt, but um, it's, uh, it's possible that Ramses II is uh, the pharaoh of the Bible, uh, not definitive. We, we don't know for sure. One of the interesting things, though, is his son, Merneptah, uh, wasn't his oldest son. His oldest son died. Okay. You don't know how, but uh, the one that was in line to be Pharaoh died uh, somewhat early. Merneptah was about his 13th son. Um, now, Merneptah becomes Pharaoh. And this is a, this is a significant stella okay, that tells a story of, or it's kind of a list, of the battles that Merneptah won. And one of the things that, that Merneptah did that he takes credit for is uh, routing the Israelites Okay, and uh, so what, what it says is Israel is laid waste, its seed is not. Okay, so I just decimated the Israelites. Now, the interesting thing about that, one of the interesting things about that, is that the, the way in which he describes Israel is not as a country, not as a nation. Okay, it's described as a people without a nation. So this helps us to date uh, the story of the Exodus to some degree, because we know that Israel existed as a people that were recognized as a people, but they didn't have a country yet. All right. Um, now, this idea of their laid waste, their seed is not, I think that's really interesting because so often when we read about, you know, what's God telling Joshua? He says, go in there and lay waste, you know, kill every living thing, just, you know, wipe them off the map. Okay. And then a few chapters later, we, you know, he'll say, and, and Joshua did all he was commanded to do by, by the Lord. But then, a few chapters later, we find those people are still there. You know, <laughs> what happened? Uh, you know, well, of course, Israel is still here. Um, so I think what's, what's happening, and this is, this is kind of my own speculation, I suppose, but uh, is that this is an idiomatic phrase. It's a little bit like when we say, you know, our football team killed them. You know, we wiped them off the field. Uh, now, we didn't literally kill anybody when we, you know, when we won the football game. So it may be when it's talking about Israel as laid waste that, you know, he had a significant battle against the Israelites and felt like, you know, hey, I really showed them. Um, but the, the, the really significant thing is this helps us to date when the Israelites existed and did not yet have a country. Uh, so, uh, again, this is another uh, temple. We'll see. This is Ramses III. Um, I, I think it's interesting here to note the uh, three different sections here. We have an outer courtyard, the inner one where the priests go. Then we have a holy of holies where only the king or the high priest can go. Uh, you, you can see that one if you go on the balloon flight. Um, you, well, you may or may not be able to see it depending on which way the wind's blowing. Um, okay, now, uh, next dynasty. Um, let me just move through these fairly quickly. I just wanted to point out 
just orient you a little bit to what's going on in the Bible. It's, it's great. You're going to Egypt now as we study the Old Testament this next year. It's just going to be so much more significant to you as you go through this history. And you're like, ah, oh, yeah, Egypt. You know, And all of a sudden you're, you're seeing Egypt is all over that Old Testament. And so David fought the Philistines and united the tribe of Israel around the 21st dynasty. David's son Solomon married an Egyptian princess. Dynasty 22. This is where we have uh, uh, Shishank, uh, Pharaoh, we think probably is to Shishak of the Bible. And that uh, we had divided kingdoms by this time where, um, you know, Rehoboam, uh, you know, he's got the kingdom of Judah. Um, Jeroboam is, is Israel. Uh, you've got these issues of, you know, is Egypt going to align itself with Egypt or, you know, with, with Assyria or, you know, who, what, what's going to happen? Um, so uh, Shishank, you know, lays siege to Judah. Uh, Rehoboam buys him off. Uh, you know, and it, it mentions how he's carrying off all the, the, uh, uh, the loot from the temple, right? Uh, so um, Indiana Jones figures out that uh, they, they must have taken the uh, Ark of the Covenant back with them to Egypt. And so Indiana Jones thinks that, you know, it must be Tannis. And so he finds the Ark of the Covenant there in Egypt. Um, and that goes back to this story about, uh, about Shishank taking the, uh, you know, the temple uh, treasure back to Egypt. Uh, incidentally, the Ark of the Covenant is not listed among the pieces of treasure that uh, Shishak takes, but, uh, you know, what the heck, uh, it's good a theory as any. Um, but then the Nubians take over. Much of Egypt's history is history of Egypt going down into what's modern-day Sudan, beating up on the Nubians down there and taking their gold, and then going back and, you know, building things and you know, like a death mask with Tutankhamun. Um, well, the Nubians have enough of this at some point, and they take over. They, they literally become pharaohs, okay, these Nubians. Um, and, and today, if you see a black African, you know, along our tour, he's probably a Nubian. Okay? In, the, in the Bible, these are the people of the land of Cush or Cushites. Okay? The Egyptians called them Nubians. Uh, interesting thing again, these people have so much respect for e the Egyptian culture and history and architecture uh, they, they become pharaohs. They're wearing all the stuff the pharaohs wear. They're, they're carving themselves onto these temples in Egypt, and they're building their own pyramids. So even today, you go to Sudan, there are more pyramids in Sudan than there are in Egypt. Um, now, this is also the period of the Shabaka stone, or Shabako stone. Okay? Now, if, if, if you've read enough Hugh Nibley, you'll know Nibley refers to the Shabako stone, or Shabaka stone. Uh, really interesting... Um, story of the creation that appears on the Shabaka stone. Uh, now, the story is that this uh, uh, pharaoh in Nubia uh, found a worm-eaten papyrus that had this creation story, and so he carves it onto the stone. And so we still have the stone now, uh, so that's the only way that the, the story survived. Um, it's thought that, uh, that this may be the oldest written record in human history. Uh, now, it's a copy of, of the oldest record, but, but this creation story uh, goes back a long, long way, maybe the earliest. You can imagine why Hugh Nibley is so interested in that. And, uh, you know, if you read um, uh, Joseph Smith Papyri, an, an Egyptian endowment, he, he mentions this. And so you might want to look up a little bit about uh, what's written about the Shabaka stone. Um, so uh, the next period, Sayyid period, um, you've got Assyria coming and going. Um, You've got the Persians in the next period. Uh, Persians, they, they didn't make a huge impact in Egypt. They would kind of go, they, they, it seemed like they kind of got bored and they kind of just leave. Um, but, uh, you know, they didn't make life easy for the Egyptians. The Egyptians did not like the Persians. Um, oh, I, sh I should mention uh, during the Sayite period, that's, that's the period when um, Lehi, you know, would have left to, to go to, uh, to, to, to America. Um, and, um, oh, you know, it's also during the Sayite period, you, you've got this issue with the Babylonian conquest, right? And so they're taking, we think of, we think of the Babylonians taking everybody and going to Babylon, but really, uh, there were about a third of the Israelites or the Hebrews, you know, the, the Judites, uh, that went to Egypt, Okay, and that becomes very significant. Uh, about a third went to Babylon. About a third stayed. 
Okay, now the people that stay, they you know, intermarry with the Canaanites, they become um, Samaritans. You know, so when we come back, you know, these people, you know, are kind of, uh, you know, lesser than, or maybe you know, polluted the bloodline. So you have those issues between the Samaritans and the, and the, uh, the Jews. Uh, but, but the ones that are in Egypt, uh, it may be that um, preserving, uh, you know, the, the scriptures, you know, preserving so many of the customs, um, so much of the history, uh, maybe depends more upon the Jews that went to Egypt uh, than anywhere else. Um, so it becomes very significant, and, uh, uh, you know, we can talk about that more later. But um, Alexander the Great comes along and uh, overpowers the Persians, okay? And then it comes to Egypt, and he's hailed as a liberator. Um, now, Alexander is as enamored with Egyptian history and culture and customs as anybody. He wants to establish himself as a pharaoh. He goes out into the desert to the uh, oracle at Siwa and uh, asks her, you know, who is my father? And she gives the right answer. She says, your father is the son. And so he says, I am the son of Ra. And they say, well, hallelujah, you kicked out the Persians. We're going to make you a god and a, and a pharaoh. And uh, he says, great. Um, I'm also going to establish a city here and name it after myself, Alexandria, which he tended to do. He would go out all over the world and make these Alexandrias everywhere. This is the Alexandria that really stuck, though. This became one of the most uh, preeminent cities of the ancient world. Um, but uh, Alexander dies young, right? He's, he pushes all the way out to India. His troops are getting bored. He, he, you know, he starts coming back. He gets a fever. He's going to die and he's in about Babylon, where they just know he's going to die. And they ask him, who, who does the kingdom go to? And um, he tells them that uh, the empire will go to the fittest. It's, it's going to go to, uh, you know, <laughs> whoever can uh, hold it, right? Uh, so it ends up getting split between his three generals. One of them is Ptolemy. Okay, now, Ptolemy then uh, takes over as governor in, in, uh, in Egypt because... Uh, again, there's a complicated family history here, but just suffice it to say that he's got so much respect for Alexander that he's just not going to take over. Alexander does have a living heir at this point uh, who dies eventually. And so then Ptolemy says, okay, fine, I will establish myself as a pharaoh. And so this establishes a new dynasty, the Ptolemaic dynasty. Uh, this was uh, some, of the, some of the greatest things we think of coming out of Egypt were established during this period. And some of the most amazing things we'll see in Egypt were built by the Ptolemies. Okay, so Ptolemy the first, he's the one that established the library at Alexandria. Uh, and he just had it in his mind that he wants to gather all of the, the wisdom of the world and collect it all into one place. Uh, one of the things he'll do is, well, you've got the, you've got the Pharaoh Lighthouse, the Pharaoh's Lighthouse, um, uh, one of the wonders of the world. Um, you know, this thing's this thing's almost as big as the Pyramid of Giza, but you know because of this, it's a great harbor at Alexandria. You've got a great lighthouse. You've got boats coming in from everywhere. They've got books or papyri. So uh, Ptolemy figures, let's go and grab those. So you know they will seize any books that are coming in, make copies of them, keep the originals with the library, and then give the copies back to uh, you know whoever was coming into harbor there. And so they start collecting you know, all of the, the wisdom from, from all over the world. And so one of the things this does, it makes it a great, uh, you know, uh, research institute. Uh, they, they, they found what's called the museum, okay? This is the, the you know, place of the muses, okay, or a museum. Okay, it's really more of a think tank, okay? So, so much of the ancient wisdom that, uh, you know, we think of um, is, is coming out of the museum or the library of Alexandria. So uh, Euclid, wrote his Elements of Geometry. Um, uh, Eratosthenes uh, calculated the circumference of the earth. Uh, Hierophilus determined that the brain, not the heart, was where uh, we, we had our intelligence. Um, we don't know where the library went. Um, it, you know, there are ideas that he was burned down or something. There was part of, there was a fire during Julius Caesar's time. Uh, probably wasn't entirely destroyed by that. It may have just come into disuse after, you know, the empire started to fall, but it, we don't know where it was now. Um, but, you know, it wasn't too long after this, uh, this period, into the Roman period, where this 
uh, during the Christian period, uh, this, this area became very significant. So you have um, so many of the early Christian fathers, Clement of Alexandria, um, Didymus, um, Oregon, um, you know, they, they established a school there that uh, tradition has it. It was started by St. Mark. Um, so this is uh, just a highly significant place um, uh, historically. Now, uh, Ptolemy II, his son, kind of carries on the tradition. Uh, he, he recognizes, you, you've got a large Jewish population in Alexandria, recognizes the wisdom of the Jews and wants to make sure we have a copy of the Bible in Greek. And so the, the, the tradition is that uh, he calls together 70 rabbis, or maybe 72, and says, okay, we want you to, to uh, translate the Hebrew scriptures into Greek. And so they all kind of go into their own room, do their translation. They come out with the exact same translation, so the, the legend goes. Um, and so that's how you, you, you have the Septuagint. Okay? And uh, incidentally, the Septuagint predates you know, what we think of the Hebrew Bible by hundreds of years. Uh, we, you know, when we go to the Hebrew Bible, uh, you know, the latest copy we had of that was, uh, you know, into, I can't remember, three or 400 A.D. Uh, until we had the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, so the Septuagint, uh, hugely significant. This was, these were the scriptures that Jesus read. And when he quotes the scriptures uh, in the New Testament, he's quoting from the Septuagint. The other thing that Ptolemy II does is expands this really, well, it was a small temple on a, an island called Philae or Philae, uh, he expands this to a large degree and builds this, what many people think is the most beautiful temple in Egypt. Here's the courtyard. Um, that's leading into, uh, into the temple itself. Um, oh, and, and notice this, uh, this figure here leading, you know, he's got his hand up like this. He's, he's got somebody by the hair. He's going to bash their brains in. Um, do you remember where that comes from? That's the Narmer Palace. Okay, so we go back, you know, almost 3,000 years, and this image, you know, the, the founding of Egypt, the uniting of the two lands, survives. And you'll see this image on many of these Ptolemaic temples. Okay, and um, there's a, you know, one of the uh, smaller temples on the temple of the island of Philae. Uh, so this is not actually the island of Philae, because the island of Philae was inundated by Lake Nasser. Okay, so this was one of those uh, areas that was going to be covered by water. And so another one where they picked everything up and they moved it to an island that was right by Philae, um, but a little higher. And so that's what that is now. I forget the name of the island, but we all call it Philae now. Um, so it's, it's really, really beautiful. We'll ride a, a small boat out to it. Um, it's a lot of fun to go out there to Philae. Now this one also uh, by, by uh, Ptolemy II. This is the Temple of Edfu. Edfu, uh, so interesting because this is probably the most well-preserved temple in Egypt. The reason for that was it was covered by sand for a long time. Uh, and so they, they, they uncover it, and you, know, you find this really beautiful temple. It's dedicated to Horus. Uh, you see this beautiful statue of Horus, beautiful colonnade there. Um, it's uh, really an exquisite temple, uh, fascinating Holy of Holies, uh, where you can see, uh, you know, this is you know, referred to as a bark shrine. Okay, This is a bark or, or, or the boat for the god. Um, when you uh, bring the god out maybe once a year to kind of parade him around, uh, you know, he'd, he'd be sitting in here all year, and they'd go in, you know, wash him, anoint him, you know, give him food, uh, but then once a year, bring him out. Okay, And so this, this gives you an idea of what that uh, would have looked like anciently. Um, and then also the temple... Of uh, was this his son? I'm trying to remember now. Um, no, it was it was uh, this was during oh, this is Ptolemy the third. Okay, so 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 th this is this is the temple of Kamambo, um, and and I should say uh, Edfu is Ptolemy the third as well. Um, and and Philae was Phi no Philae was Ptolemy the second. He's Septuagint man. Uh, the third is Edfu and Kamambo. Okay. Uh, Kamambo, I, I think there's some beautiful stuff here, some really interesting stuff. One of the really interesting things, this is a double temple. Part of it is dedicated to the god Sobek, the crocodile god, okay? the idolatrous god of Pharaoh. Uh, so very interesting. 
uh, that uh, there is that connection where Joseph Smith is saying that on, on facsimile number one, the book of Abraham, you've got that uh, crocodile down at the bottom. And, you know, and, uh, you know, an ignorant farm boy in upstate New York might have looked at that and said, looks like a crocodile to me, you know, or a sea monster or something else. He says this, is, this represents the idolatrous god of Pharaoh. Uh, people didn't know all that much of anything at the time about Egypt. Um, uh, Egyptology was first, or, you know, Egyptomania was starting to come into swing there. People were getting so interested because Napoleon had, had gone into Egypt. But um, uh, Egyptian, people didn't know how to read it yet. Uh, there was, uh, Champollion had just barely cracked the code. But, you know, once you, you're able to read a word or two, it doesn't mean you know everything about, you know, all the history and all the mythology. And uh, so it's an interesting point, isn't it? Um, but one of the things they would do is keep, they probably had these wells filled with crocodiles, and, uh, and they would mummify them. Um, you know, this is one of the things they're doing to worship the crocodile god. And so right next to Kamambo, there's a crocodile museum. So we can go in there and walk through there to see all these mummified crocodiles. Uh, it's kind of wild. Um, but, um, you know, also during this period, um, <clears throat> they have, this is, uh, well, it's a replica of the Rosetta Stone, okay? Um, so Ptolemy III, um, he's uh, doing a good job for the priests, you know, keeping them fat and happy. And so they send him a, you know, a, a, a greeting card by way of a huge rock, um, you know right in there about uh, how great Ptolemy is that he's done all this great stuff for them. Okay, so this is, uh, this is an exhibit that you'll see at the uh, University of Utah if you go there. And I like what they did with this because you have the, uh, what the Rosetta Stone looks like now if you go to the British Museum to see it. But you also see this outline here of what it originally would have looked like as you know, a full stella. Um, so that was created during this period. Okay, now... You know, that brings us up to about the time, well, there are lots more Ptolemies. Um, uh, Ptolemy, 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 they, they tend to marry women named Cleopatra. Uh, so about half the Ptolemies are marrying Cleopatras. So we get down to Cleopatra the seventh, who's the Cleopatra that we know. Okay, and, and so this is where you start to have the Roman influence. Okay, um, Egypt's starting to lose its power. Um, they're they're, they're uh, really threatened with being annexed by Rome. Uh, so they start to make these deals, you know, to try to uh, maintain some independence, but um, doesn't really work out. Uh, what ends up happening is, the, you know, the Romans come in. Um, now, if you, if, you want, if you want the details of this story, you ought to go watch uh, Elizabeth Taylor's movie. Uh, it really does a pretty good job of, of following the history, down, down even to the, the, the detail where, um, you know, the... Uh, Soldiers have laid siege to the palace, and you know Julius Caesar's there, and, and Cleopatra wants to sneak in to, to you know ask him if you know he will side with her over her brother when there's a civil war going on, and so she sneaks in inside this carpet. They bring in the carpet as a gift to Caesar and roll it out, and there's Elizabeth Taylor, you know, it rolls out in front of Caesar, you know, and he's just uh, flabbergasted by this, and 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 that's historical. Um, so there are so many of these different kinds of things that appear in the movie that, you know, give you, it's a really complicated story. It's a long movie, uh, has to be. Um, but uh, it would be a fun thing to see um, in preparation for Egypt. But th this is a Roman amphitheater. This gives you an idea then of what happened. You know, once uh, uh, Julius Caesar is assassinated, you know, they fight over control of Egypt. And finally, Rome asserts its power and authority over Egypt. So Cleopatra really is, I mean, there were some people after Cleopatra that are known as, as pharaohs, but she's really kind of considered the last pharaoh because after this point, uh, things just, just crumble for, for Egypt. Uh, it's never known as a world power again. And, um, uh, you know, but uh, we, uh, we, we've got the history, right? And there was so much... Uh, that was preserved that uh, we've been able to find since then. Um, so many really interesting things to see. Um, so much uh, uh, influence on civilization that uh, really, I think, like I said, influences the Greeks, influences the Romans, which in turn influences, influences all of us. Um, so that, uh, that brings it to our stopping point. Um, Dan Peterson will pick it up 
from here to bring you up to the current day. But um, with that, I, uh, I don't know if anybody has any uh, questions or if you're all tired and need to go home, but uh, go ahead. Uh, the pit statue you had, the Temple of Ramses, there were four statues of him in the front. Two on one side had the conical head and the other two had the square one. Was that depicting the uniting of the upper and lower Egypt? Oh, that's a good question. Let's look at the picture. Um, yeah, so these are these are different. I, uh, oh, the entrance. Oh, oh, those, those. Um, yeah, so uh, that conical one, yeah. Um, now, I don't see that we've got the Deshret crown here. Mostly he's wearing that, that headdress that has the, uh, the cobra. Um, and see, that, that cobra is considered to be the protector of, of the pharaohs. And that's, that's where we get, I think, maybe that's where we get the, the, the idea that, that Cleopatra uh, died from a, an asp bite or a cobra bite. Um, maybe not true, uh, because historically they also say that she died uh, peacefully. And, and a cobra bite would not be very peaceful. Uh, it would be really painful and excruciating. So it may, might be a symbol of, of how Cleopatra was protected by this cobra from being enslaved and taken to Rome as a slave. But as far as, as, far as this goes, um, it, does, it does look like that that is the conical crown on one of them. But I, I don't see the Deshret crown, you know, the red crown on, on the other ones. Maybe it's, maybe it's the one that fell. <laughs> That's a good question. We'll have to look for it when we go there. <laughs> yeah. How did the beautiful statue of the queen get to Berlin? I'm oh, just Nefertari. wondering if it was taken by Napoleon to France and when, the way, no, when Germany invaded. It wasn't. It was, it was discovered by Germans in about 1956, I think. Archaeologists that were excavating, I think it was in Amarna. They found it. They found it, yeah. And, and it wasn't for a long time after. So... Uh, I'd, I'd like. I'm going to, to Berlin next year. I'm, I'm, I hope I can go to that museum and see that that bust because it's it's exquisite. Any other questions? All right. Uh, we didn't have any questions on the on the internet, did we? No. Just okay. to help with Malta. Oh, Malta! Great. Well, thank, thank you. All right. Well, um, look forward to seeing you again next week with uh, Carrie Mulestein. But thanks for coming.